namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa the buddha's path as he himself said is entirely about suffering and the end of suffering so that his teachings were always spoken with that purpose in mind to help lead beings out of suffering. In this world, there are many causes of suffering, many sources of suffering. Some of them that are enumerated are sickness, old age, and death for example, and these are universal. No one escapes from this kind of suffering. But there is a large component of the suffering that beings endure that is completely optional. It's unnecessary. This is the suffering that comes from our own mental formations and mental states. And this is something that is very common, even universal amongst human beings, that we get caught up in our mental forms and they cause us a great deal of distress. There are two kind of guidelines or simple pieces of advice that uh, I think are very useful in dealing with uh, mental states that cause us anguish and a lot of suffering could be avoided if these were understood and acted upon. One is that we need to take responsibility for our own mind states. And this is uh, often difficult for beings to do. There are external forces in the world that can cause suffering, both natural forces and actions of other sentient beings. And these are not very much within our control, if at all. But those states that arise in our mind in reaction to that, that's our responsibility. It's so easy and so common for people to make excuses for their mental states, saying, oh, that person so-and-so makes me so angry. No, that person's acting unskillfully, but the anger is all on you. The anger is something that is generated in your own mind. Learning to tame the mind is a huge part of the practice. And the Buddha often used these um, metaphors of training horses or elephants seeing the mind as a as a an animal to be tamed one of the clearest expositions of this was the buddha talking about how they train an elephant for the royal service you know, because he of course came from the kshatriya class so he was well versed in the ways of the, the warrior nobles he said they they take a wild elephant and they chain it to a a sturdy stake post in the ground on a, on a long chain. And at first the elephant rampages and roars and runs around this way and that trying to get free. Then after some time it settles somewhat and it paces around in a circle. Then at uh, even a later date, it lies down peacefully beside the post. And at that time, they can take the chain off and begin training it. And use that metaphor to express how the mind behaves. And the, the metaphor is just said that the post represents the object of meditation. And the chain represents the uh, awareness or the focus on the object. And as long as the mind remains attached to that 
that post it can't go too far but it will at first rage and storm and carry on so training the mind is not uh, is not necessarily an easy thing to do it's not necessarily an easy task but it's one that's essential the sixth factor of the Noble Eightfold Path is right effort, samawayamo. And the effort is defined in terms of taming the mind to encourage wholesome states that have arisen and to rouse up wholesome states that have not yet arisen, to diminish those unwholesome states that have arisen and to prevent the arising of new unwholesome states. There's the four right efforts four components of Samawayamo. An Arahant, amongst the other qualities of an Arahant, one of them is that he is the master of the pathways of his mind. He thinks only what and when he wants to think and not otherwise. For those who are not yet Arahants, the process of thinking can sometimes be unruly. We have a difficulty controlling our thoughts. We have difficulty quieting our thoughts. But there is always an element of volition involved in thinking. So there is a kama associated with thinking. And it's a big part of the, the, the training is learning to control the mind. Because it is, to go back to the initial point, it is your responsibility. External factors, of course, they affect the mind but they don't have to sway the mind off of the, the center point if one is mindful and clear. The other way of looking at this, or the other piece of wisdom in dealing with the mind, besides taking responsibility for your own mind states, would also say not to take your mind states seriously. And this is something that is very difficult for a lot of people. And people can be driven into all kinds of suffering by taking their mind states, something that arises in their mind, taking that as real and significant, important, something that must be dealt with or acted on. The ultimate way of transcending this or pushing through this is to see the emptiness of the mind states. That Sankara is the ideas, the images, the impulses, the fears, the desires that arise in the mind, they're not real. They're empty. It's smoke and mirrors. There's nothing there. And if you make them into something real and important and significant, then you're going to suffer. You're not going to be free. You're constrained then to following these ghostly impulses in the mind. It can help sometimes to have a bit of a sense of humor about your own mind states. Instead of allowing yourself to become further upset when unskillful states arise in the mind, to see them as ridiculous. Well, it's just my mind playing this, this old tune again and not taking them seriously, not investing them with significance or importance. The sankaras, the mental formations, are, are without substance. All the five khandhas are, are empty and void, but the sankaras definitely be able to see them as empty. You know, there's an idea, a notion, an image in the mind has, has no substance, it has no weight. It has ultimately no significance or importance. Even when it references real-world phenomena, it's not itself that phenomena. It's only a mirage. I recall uh, Kima Ananda one time saying that uh, he had come to the conclusion that the universe is a big joke. And somebody present objected to that and says, oh, I don't find it very funny. And Kima said, that's because you haven't reached the punchline yet. <laughs> But it's so easy to take ourselves so seriously and see things from uh, 
self-centric point of view and put great importance on the mental formations and to believe them is so important. It often happens in the, if someone's on a meditation retreat and doing intensive meditation that they can get obsessed on some small idea of something that needs to be dealt with and it can very often drive the person out of their meditation and then what but once they stop meditating then they suddenly see oh that's not so important after all i don't need to worry about that what has initiated the change was just an idea just a formation in the mind it's not that for mental formations are without any intrinsic value. There is a use and a purpose of mental formations. So we wouldn't be able to function in the world without being able to think, and to, to work things out. But when this process changes from being the servant to becoming the master, then it's out of kilter. It's imbalanced. Another angle on this from the Thai forest tradition perspective, the idea of, or the practice of, centering your being in the chitta, the knowing mind, rather than the thinking mind, or the feeling mind, or the, the sensing mind, the knowing mind, that which knows, puru, so the clear awareness. Because that clear awareness is ultimately simple, ultimately pure, and ultimately undefiled. It just is as it is. And if one is centered in that position, then the formations that arise in the mind can be seen as it were externally. And they're seen as empty. They're seen as without intrinsic significance, without substance. And we know from meditation that there's a, a great relief and a great peacefulness when the mind can reach a, a place where the formations cease, or the mind quiets. If we look at the, um, the jhana path, mind in samadhi, in first jhana there still remains vitaka vichara, which are the, the energies that are behind thinking. In the context of the meditation, they're used for striking and holding the object. But they are the energy behind speech and thought. Speech and thought is built of mutaka vichara. So there's still some presence of these in first jhana. But when these are stilled and made quiescent, then that's the mind enters into second jhana. And this releases the factor of piti, of joy. This energetic joy. And it's a natural phenomena that occurs when the thinking process is made quiescent and there's an uprising of joy. And the Vipassana path, when one applies the, the clear awareness to the thinking process, it can be seen how thoughts arise and how they cease. And the emptiness of them can be observed and known. And again, there's a tendency or a movement towards quiescence. Because when the mind sees the thought process clearly, it sees the very origin of the thought, it can even get behind that and see the intention to think. Even before there's any content to the thought, there's a, a kind of a welling up or a gelling in the mental continuum. And there's a beginning an embryo of a thought, a seed. And if that's clearly seen, the process can stop right there and no, no thought occurs. The mistake to make that, that uh, it's very easy to get caught in is to look at thought with mindfulness. You know, I'm talking about with an attempt to practice Vipassana, to look at thought and become interested in the content Whereas the content is of no significance for the understanding of the nature of thought. If you're identifying with the content, then you're already lost. You're not doing vipassana. You're following the thought formations and you're, you're caught in them. One is moved away from the center, from the clear knowing into the periphery. 
into the subsidiary parts of being. Think of a, uh, a hurricane. And the, the eye of the storm is still. And if you remain at the eye of the storm, then it's peaceful. But if you get interested in the things that are being whirled around, go out into the storm and you're lost. The real uh, essence of vipassana is when you see all phenomena, internal, external, physical, mental, in terms of the three characteristics. You see them as dukkha, as imperfect, as suffering, as compounded. And you see them as anicca. You see their impermanent, transitory nature. They come and they go. Nothing lasts. Nothing persists at the ultimate level. Nothing persists for even a moment. And most deeply, you see them as empty. You see them without a self-essence. There's no sva bhava. There's no own essence. Nothing exists from its own side. It's all empty. It's all void. Void of what? Void of substance void of significance, void of independence. The Buddha warned against the quality of a papancha, which has been translated as proliferation. It's the um, tendency of the mind to spin and spin and weave and take an idea that itself is empty and void and run with it and keep building on it and build whole big structures in the mind and get lost in them. When uh, thinking or talking about this uh, aspect of the teaching, I always always uh, remember the, the corny old joke about the, um, the neurotic is defined as one who builds sandcastles in the air and the uh, psychotic lives in them and the psychiatrist collects the rent. So these structures we build in the mind, you know, and we all do it, they are definitely a dukkha. They cause us suffering. And the degree of suffering that we experience depends upon the degree we invest in ourself in them. If we see them as something important, something that needs to be followed up on, then we're caught in it. You know, we're caught in that, uh, that structure, that web that web that the mind has weaved. And they're impermanent because they come and go, they shift, they change with time. At the moment, they can seem set in stone and viable and heavy and real, but they change, they morph. And if you see them clearly, you see they're doing that on a momentary level. But mostly they're empty, they're without substance. They're completely void. The, the creations of our mind are just shadows, smoke and mirrors. It's a measure of how foolish we are as human beings that we allow ourselves to get caught in those, in those structures. When if we could see them clearly all the time, we'd see that they're empty and there's, there's nothing to rely on, nothing to lean on, no place to go. Recall them, the phrases the Buddha used to describe the enlightened mind, that it's boundless, luminous, and finds no footing. That last phrase is difficult in translation, but finds no footing is a, is a very literal translation from the Pali. This is, the mind is not based on anything. It doesn't take a stand it has no place to stand because it doesn't require it. It doesn't need to take a basis on anything so that there's no formation there and it's boundless. When you're caught in formations, you've created a boundary. You limited yourself. The free mind is boundless. It's not restricted in any way. And it's luminous. This is the light as a... Uh, as a metaphor for consciousness. The citta 
is said in the uh, Guttur Nikaya, the chitta is described as luminous. It illuminates all things. When we're caught in formations, it's like we're putting filters in front of the light. We're distorting it. We're casting shadows on the wall rather than being with the source. So you can work with these you know, these uh, these ways of dealing with the mind. You know, see the mind as an unruly beast to be tamed uh, in the, the metaphor of the uh, training of an elephant. And when it's trained, paradoxically, it then becomes free. The boundaries fall away. The luminosity of the chitta shines forth without obstruction. And that's without footing. It was not taking a stand anywhere. 